Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, this court is now in session, and that one was a tough act to follow, but we have a panel of extraordinarily distinguished former judges, and are hoping that all of you can reveal a side of judging that the sitting judges were not able to reveal. The Judicial Code of Conduct prescribes what a sitting judge can say, so I want to start with the toughest case that each of you has decided, and take us inside your decision-making process to reveal the human cost and the way that you struggled with it. Uh, Jeremy, Judge Fogel, you have described uh, the California lethal injection case, Morales and Tilton, as the most challenging case you ever decided. You said it required, demanded the most of me, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually, of any matter that has ever appeared on my docket. Take us inside your thought process and describe emotionally, spiritually, and intellectually what it was like to decide that case. Well, I, I don't want to take up all the time. Uh, <laughs> but <clears throat> I, would, I wrote that in a, in a law review article uh, a number of years ago, and I would uh, adopt every word of it today. Um, so this case involved the protocol that California was using at the time to carry out executions. And the um, issue was actually quite narrow. The question was whether the uh, protocol, the, the, the drugs that were used to carry out the executions were performing properly. And the um, showing that was made by the plaintiff was that, that it wasn't, that there had been uh, 13 executions and that there had been problems in a majority of them that were demonstrated by, uh, by basically undisputed evidence. Um, and so uh, I was faced with this decision where I had to decide whether to allow an execution to proceed. And the uh, defendant in the, in the capital case, the plaintiff in my case, uh, as most capital cases are, uh, the crime was absolutely horrific. Uh, and uh, the evidence was very, very strong. There was no question about whether he was guilty. Uh, nor was there really any question as to whether uh, the death sentence was appropriate given a death penalty, and I'm not going to go into that moral issue now, but just the criteria that were, were in place at the time. But there were problems with the protocol, and uh, there was pretty compelling evidence that there were problems with the protocol. And so um, I needed to do something about that because the problems in the protocol would have resulted in anybody being executed under it, being exposed to a level of suffering that the state stipulated was unconstitutional. It was not a question of my beliefs. It was actually an undisputed fact. Um, and um, so I stopped the execution. And then there was proceedings for quite some time after that, uh, trying to figure out what the remedy was going to be. And then a lot of other stuff happened, and there haven't been any executions since then. But but, but, but the point is that um, my job in that case was to decide a very discreet issue, which was, was there an unconstitutionally great risk of uh, suffering that violated the Eighth Amendment? And what happened in the actual event was that it was seen by the public as a case that had to do with whether the death penalty is a good thing or not, whether uh, Mr. Morales, the plaintiff, deserved to die or not, whether the victim, Terry Winchell, had uh, d deserved retribution for what had, what had happened to her. And that's what everybody got excited about. And there was a firestorm that was all about that stuff and had nothing to do with the decision that I made. And I had to live with that. Um, I, I was saying in the, in the green room that I'm so grateful that it happened before anybody had heard of social media. Uh, that um, I got some nasty mail, no question about that. I got some letters saying that I was an idiot and so forth. And I got some, some, uh, um, some email, there was email then, and got some email saying essentially the same thing. Uh, but, you know, it was a couple hundred letters and emails. And, you know, today, if I had made that decision, or if, he, or if uh, social media had existed then, uh, there would have been millions, I, I assure you, millions of, of responses. Uh, there would have been death threats. There would have been, uh, there, there were 
there are colleagues, uh, of former colleagues of mine in the federal courts who had that type of response to decisions they made in cases which were met much less incendiary than the case I decided. But even so, um, I was afraid to leave my house for several days. Uh, there certainly was um, a, a level of trauma that I experienced that it took me a while to work through. Uh, actually, writing the article that uh, Jeff quoted um, helped me work through that because it was really reminding myself that that's my job, you know, and people could disagree with the decision I made or not, but, but it was from the beginning, it was about what the law required. Uh, it wasn't about how I feel about the death penalty. It wasn't about how I feel about Michael Morales. And so, you know, I had to come back and anchor myself to the, the, the reason why I was doing the job. And, and, and Justice Guzman and, and, and Judge Breyer said it absolutely perfectly, I think. You know, the, the, your job is to decide the case based on the facts and the law. It's not to stick your finger in the wind and figure out what the public wants, and it's not to go off in, in, in directions that, that don't have anything to do with the case before you. Uh, so, you know, one of the, I'll just finish by saying, you know, a, a couple years later, somebody, uh, a group of people who don't like the death penalty, uh, wanted to honor me, you know, for making this decision. And I, I said, I really wish you hadn't, I wish you wouldn't do that. Because I didn't make my decision because of any feeling I have about the death penalty. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a decision I made because I'm a judge who's trying his best to follow the law. So, so that's, um, was and still is the hardest case I've had. Justice Marino, you were the sole dissenter in the Prop 8 case where the Supreme Court, the, the, the court upheld the uh, anti-gay uh, marriage proposition, and you made that decision at a time when you were being considered for the Supreme Court by President Obama, which made the decision especially courageous. Describe whether that played any role in your decision and how you dealt with what you must have known would be considerable pushback. Well, I mean, absolutely, absolutely not in the impact uh, how I felt about that case. I'd actually, <clears throat> the matter had been already argued before us some, t some months before that period of time when I was on the, on the uh, short list, uh, and I felt uh, very strongly uh, about affirming uh, our earlier decision in the marriage uh, cases, finding the family code statute to be uh, unconstitutional, what was difficult about my position was not so much the, the public exposure, but to find a way that I could, in a principal way, uh, find that the a measure, uh, Proposition 8 itself, was unconstitutional. So together with my various law clerks, uh, I had written earlier about the distinction between an amendment and a revision to the Constitution. I mean, judges uh, are obligated to follow the Constitution, and if you recall in this case, the Constitution had been amended by Proposition 8, so therefore I was obligated to follow the Constitution. So in that sense, my hands were tied, but the uh, device, if you want to call it that, that I used was that there were so many rights, constitutional rights that were implicated uh, in that proposition, whether it's the right to, to privacy and so many other, uh, the right to marriage and so forth, that the only way that the Constitution could properly be amended uh, was by a constitutional uh, convention. Uh, so uh, I didn't get any votes, uh, but uh, uh, I think I just had to stick with that uh, with that decision, because I thought that the the constellation of rights that were implicated by Proposition Eight was not the, the right way to really fundamentally change that fundamental right. So, you know, I just wanted to say something about the death penalty, though, because on, on the court, you know, I probably participated in about 200 death penalty yeah. uh, decisions. Most of them were affirmances. Uh, so you do develop uh, kind of an attitude towards uh, cases, and as Jeremy pointed out, generally. Uh, you see the worst of the worst. I mean, there are disparities from county to county uh, mm -hmm. in California, but uh, putting those aside, uh, 
the main concern uh, I had about the death penalty, and I can say this uh, now because I, I, I joined a rebuttal uh, statement in one of the elections, I think it was 2012, and, and my position was that, you know, for the expense that uh, these uh, appeals and the habeas in federal court and state court go through, the lack of uh, deterrence, the disproportionality of you know, who you kill and where you live and where, you know, all of that stuff, and then the lack of uh, trained attorneys uh, who can really handle that specialty of death penalty appeals and habeas. Uh, even Chief Justice Ron George and others have said the system was dysfunctional and broken. So my opposition to the death penalty in that ballot statement was basically addressed to that. But in terms of uh, another trial, there might be trial defects as well. Putting those aside, I mean, I had some concerns about certain trial defects I don't need uh, to go into, but that was the principal reason that I was uh, against the death penalty. But when you mentioned the, the most difficult case, and I think some of the federal judges would, uh, trial judges would appreciate this, the cases that I actually struggled with were the uh, uh, illegal entries uh, with the, was the two prior, two predicate felonies, yeah. and sentencing uh, someone who came to this country when they're like two years old, didn't speak Spanish, no relatives in, in, in whatever Latin American country they were from, and here they are, they have a family that's in the audience, and then the guidelines require, at least at that time, we didn't really have a uh, early disposition uh, program uh, in the Central District. I think San Diego did. But you know, to sentence someone uh, to eight years, I think I sentenced someone to eight years in, in federal custody only to be deported, he'd be deported to a country that he really had absolutely no memory, no connection to whatsoever. I mean, I had to follow the law. I mean, I could depart in some you know, rational way, but not, not, not a lot to make a difference. So to me personally, those were actually the most difficult sentencing decisions yeah. I had to do. Wow. Uh, Judge Taha, you had an extraordinary range of cases from Eighth Amendment cases examining whether exposure to secondhand smoke is cruel and unusual punishment to some really important equal protection cases involving domestic violence. What was the toughest? And really, was there a case in which you feared that you were not separating your political from your constitutional views where you might be succumbing to fear of public criticism and where you really struggled to make the right decision? Uh, well, this is where you're probably not aware of your own implicit biases, because I'd say no to the answer to your question is no. But I, to your the original question that you ask, and I think uh, in an eye into the process that a judge follows, I'll tell a story on myself, Eighth Amendment story. Again, death penalty story in our circuit. Uh, the states all had the death penalty along with the federal government. I was a very new judge, and it goes to what some of the panel before us said too. There's, there's maybe judge school, but there's learning to be a judge, and there's a big difference. Uh, I had a very difficult uh, death penalty case as the panel author. And I followed the state involved was Oklahoma, as a matter of record. Uh, I followed the line of cases uh, on whether the death penalty was appropriate, and their um, standard was whether it was heinous, atrocious, and cruel. And so I followed all the cases, and we did a really good compendium of the outcomes of all those cases. And in the panel opinion, I affirmed and upheld the death penalty. My court voted to rehear the case to the point that was made earlier. And I changed my position and I wrote the in-bank opinion going the other way. And here's why, it's a matter of process. I took all those cases, every single death penalty case, from um, the state of Oklahoma up to that moment. And we dissected the facts of those cases individually, 
case by case to see whether the state courts, this was a habeas, see whether the state courts had uniformly applied the same standards to the same set of facts. So that for months, I had a law clerk and I who were working on this table of what the facts were. So it wasn't only a matter of following the cases. I finally, in the end, decided we have got to go delve into the facts of these cases, and the in-bank opinion came out the other way. So to your original point, and that's an example of how judges work behind the scenes. Uh, it was because of the in-bank rehearing process, a lot of discussion among the judges. Uh, I'd challenge anybody to be in a harder meeting of any group, anywhere, than an in-bank rehearing a meeting of a court of appeals, and I assume the Supreme Court, but uh, I've only seen the court of appeals. They are the most thoughtful, careful, non-emotional, um, law-related discussions there are. So what the public doesn't see about the decision-making process is it is made better by the quality of a court and the quality of what is insisted upon before you come to a final decision. So that one was hard. The secondhand smoke one, I gotta just say, I got reversed at the Supreme Court. This was, this was before we really knew how bad smoking was, but it's another example of how um, uh, uh, the court works together. It was a garden variety, pro se uh, case, and I wrote a really short opinion saying, uh, <laughs> Um, putting a smoker with a non-smoker in a cell is not a violation of the Constitution, duh, at the time. Well, one of my colleagues said, you know, you know, I think we better look at this. You know, there's some evidence out there, and this was a pro se, so you have to construe liberally and all those things. And so, um, well, fast forward, we held that, uh, we continued to hold that it was not a violation of the Constitution. And guess what? Uh, it turned out to be a violation of the Constitution. And I got all kinds, to the point of long before social media, I got the funniest, funniest cartoons and letters. One of them was the warden of the prison with a napkin over his wrist saying, would you prefer smoking or non-smoking? <laughs> so the process itself works very, very well when you work in a collegial court and you put your colleagues to the test of what the evidence is, what the law is, all of those things. So those are kind of two examples. Great. Well, uh, Jeremy, unsurprisingly, since we picked the judges, so far the audience has uh, examples of models of reason rather than passion, both current and former judges resisting pressures and making the right decisions. But you've had a bird's eye view on the inner life of judges. You've taught them and uh, described the role of a judge as closer to a clergyman than uh, anything else, the need to set aside your ego to be governed by the truth. What I want to just ask you candidly is, do you believe that the pressures of social media are, as Judge Breyer said, polarizing judges, leading them to seek the approval of the crowd, sometimes making the popular decision rather than the wrong one? And give us a, some sp a specific example or two of cases where you think that actually is happening. Yeah, so let me answer your question this way. I don't think it's quite as linear as that. Uh, I don't think I certainly don't know of any judges who wake up and read Twitter and then they just figure out that's how they're going to decide their cases that day. I don't think, I don't think it works like that. But, but, I, but I do think that what's happened is that it's harder and harder to insulate yourself from what's going on in the, in the community. And, and you don't even have to be a Twitter follower. I mean, I am. I don't, I don't tweet, but I, but I follow. And... And you know, you you see the stuff people are saying, and you see the the ways people are perceiving things, and I think somewhere it, it embeds itself in your in your consciousness. And then you see things happen to people, and I, I need to mention a couple. Um, so you know, the the uh, travel ban cases, uh, of which there were several, uh, but the first one was decided by by Judge Robart in Seattle, um, and just 
because it seems relevant to say this, Judge Robart was appointed by George W. Bush. He's a Republican. Uh, so he wasn't somebody who's always one of those, those liberal activist judges, and he's not. But he decided this case, and he, he decided it against the administration. And he got, in a relatively short period of time, over a million uh, uh, hits on Twitter and other social media, basically suggesting that he was a traitor. Uh, there were people threatening his life. Uh, some of the death threats were credible enough that uh, the marshals uh, had to provide security for him. Uh, and I've talked to him, he's a friend, and, and you know, he said it was incredibly traumatic for him to, to have gone through that experience. And, and all he did was, and, if you, and actually his, his hearing was um, videotaped. They, they, in the Ninth Circuit, you can have cameras in the courtroom. So his hearing is actually, there's a video available of it. And, and you can watch it, and at least from my perspective, you know, and I know that I'm looking at it as a former judge, you know, was, he was a model of decorum. He listened to everybody. He was very careful. He was very thoughtful. Everybody had a chance to make their arguments. And so I'm watching this thing. This is great. I mean, people should see this, because this is what judges actually do. And that didn't stop people from just pillaring him on, on social media. And it had an effect on him. And he's a federal judge with life tenure. So then you go to the state courts. We haven't really talked about the state courts. We have a federal heavy group here, although Justice Guzman is a state court judge. And you know, then you're talking about people who don't have that protection. They have to stand for election in most states. Uh, they, they're in smaller communities. I mean, particularly judges in small counties uh, you know, where you can't go to the grocery store without running into somebody who knows you uh, as a judge. Uh, and, and, and then you add social media to that, and there literally is nowhere to hide, and you have people who don't understand what you're doing. So it's a real problem, and I think that it is an added stressor for particularly state court judges. Uh, but it's a stressor for federal judges, too, to, to know that there's this chatter going on and that so much of it is not informed. And that's not to take anything away from the public's right to have opinions. I mean, we need to do a better job of explaining what we're doing and why we're doing it. But but it seems to me the fact is that, that there's a lot of disinformation and misinformation. So I'll just mention one other case. Since I already mentioned one very controversial case, I'll mention another one. It's not one of my cases. It was a case that happened in San Jose, which is where my, my, my life was, uh, until I went to the Federal Judicial Center. And we had a, a judge on the Superior Court there who decided the, the Stanford Swimmer case. It got international attention. Um, and who ended up being recalled um, because he had made this decision that was perceived as being too lenient. Um, I'm not going to weigh in on this. I mean, I will say, because you know, I'm being candid, and I can be now, you know, I would have given a different sentence. I would have given a more severe sentence than he did. But, but that's irrelevant to the point I want to make, which is that the, the case became about how do you feel about sexual assault. That's what the case became about. Just like my case was how do you feel about the death penalty. It became about how do you feel about sexual assault. We need to make a statement that the treatment of people who commit sexual assaults is too lenient. And this is the way we're going to make the statement. We're going to hold this judge accountable for giving a sentence that was recommended by the probation officer, was within the legal range. He articulated reason. There was nothing from a legal standpoint wrong with what he did. And it, it raises a question of what we're doing, right? I mean, what, where is the line between judges making decisions based on the law and the facts and then the public's desire in a, in a given case for a particular outcome. And I, I think that's an incredibly stressful place for judges these days, particularly judges who have to stand for election. Uh, and I think it's been amplified enormously by, by social media. So that's my answer. Yeah. Add, yeah. add to yeah. that, since I've, yeah. I've served on both the, the state bench and the uh, federal bench, uh, one of my predecessors on the uh, California Supreme Court, Justice Otto Kaus, famously said, uh, it's hard to ignore the crocodile in the bathtub while you're shaving. Right. <laughs> uh, so, and that was before social media. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, by and large, I think my colleagues would agree. I mean, I mean, 
judges, you know, bring a certain, I mean, they, they, they bring a, a degree of integrity and fidelity to the law, and they decide on basis of principles and legal principles uh, and so forth. Uh, so I don't have any qualms about that. But I think what's happened in the last, you know, 10, 15 years, let's say, is there's a perception now that uh, judges are, are predisposed based, and for one example would be based on uh, who was the executive, the governing authority that appointed them. I mean, there was an election here in San Francisco. Uh, it didn't matter if the judges were actual Democrats or, or Republicans, but if they were appointed by a Republican, a group from a certain office opposed those those judges just on the basis of that uh, perception. So perception now seems to control the day, and and the general public. I mean, they do look at Judge Judy, of course, but they look at uh, they think that judges are partisan, uh, and that they're gonna they come to cases uh, uh, predispose a rule a certain way. And I think that's that's not true. It's completely inaccurate. Judge, Judge Tom. Um, are, uh, should should judges tweet? Let's set a state I, I, judges. Uh, state not. state. <laughs> you, you said absolutely. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah. And, but and is there for, a difference? Is there a difference between the state and federal bench in that regard? State judges have to be politically appointable, as Justice I, Guzman said. And you know, I at least in California, uh, I don't think there's really in the, the code of conduct would 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 ban or prescribe uh, judges tweeting. Even, even I'm a, now a, a, an arbitrator, and one of the questions in the forms, the disqualification forms we fill out, are, are, are we active on, on Facebook or any other kind of social media? Because lawyers now will, they'll search your whole history and your views and so forth, and that's all discoverable in litigation as well. So uh, I would eschew any kind of activity of a political or judicial nature on any kind of uh, social social media, because uh, in the line of work that I am now in, if 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 I were uh, presenting my views on social media, uh, a creative uh, lawyer who was unhappy with my one of my rulings could could claim that I was predisposed, and the outcome of the case mm -hmm. uh, reflected that that bias. Judge Taha, what do you think about tweeting judges? And I'll, I'll note that for, for James Madison, the idea of even tweeting presidents would have been anathema, because he said any direct communication between representatives and the people would encourage passion rather than reason. Judges are supposed to be even more insulated. Is there a danger that tweeting judges will play to the crowd and be susceptible to being swayed by the passions of the crowd? I'm sure that I fall into the Judge Breyer category of being of a certain age and not knowing how to do anything. But I will have to say, and easy for me to say because I have never been a state judge and have never had to run for election, but I believe whether you're a current judge or a, uh, or a former judge, you have a role to play in, in modeling for the rest of society what civilized discourse and, and civilized disagreement looks like. And allowing each side in a controlled environment to have its say is really important. And also this whole notion of judges being, because of who appointed them or being uh, partisan politicians, is it seems to me encouraged by every modicum of a judge take, taking sides before he or she has uh, heard the case, been involved in it, decided it. We have a job to do, and it is to say to the public, there is a third branch of government here, and the third branch of government takes a, an oath to follow the law. We do the best we can to come to the right result. Now, that does not answer the tweeting question, and my, my friend, Justice Guzman, I suspect doesn't tweet about the outcomes of cases or anything like that. I suspect, although now I'm going to have to figure out, I'll get some kid to show me how to look at her Twitter thing. Um, <laughs> it's not that hard. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I actually do have Twitter on my phone. I almost never look at it uh, uh, for totally different reasons. Uh, I, I find it distracting. But uh, if anything verged in social media on calling into question 
the judge's view on a case or on attorneys or on litigants or the kind of issue involved or anything that verged on the substance, it would really be for me uh, the kind of thing that would at least challenge my understanding of the impartial judge. So just to add to that, let me just add to that, and that is that, uh, you know, I don't, th I don't think judges should be recluses or ciphers, and they, for human beings they should participate uh, in, in society. But I do think we have, I think you were hinting at this, Daniil, is that uh, we have an obligation to do public outreach to educate the community, uh, students, law students, uh, the general community, the different uh, clubs that exist out there. So in that sense, we are public figures, and I think we have an obligation to educate the public on the legal I, system. I, I completely agree with that. And I would just say that I'm not sure we're doing it entirely the right way. Mm -hmm. that, that I think the civics education part of it is, is necessary, but it's not sufficient. I think it is important that people understand what, how judges are different from legislators or different from executive. I mean, I think that's, that's very important. I think it's great when students come to courtrooms and they see what judges are doing and they, you know, I had a junior high school class come to my courtroom a number of years ago and re really what they were most interested in was the leg monitors that the, the people were being uh, given when they were put on supervised release. But, you know, that, sure. but, but I mean, at least they were getting a sense of, of you know, how, the, how, the, uh, how things work. I think what we're not doing, and really this had something to do with why we wanted to do this program, is we're not really telling our story, and I think we're trying to do this tonight, and I think we're going to keep trying to do it. We're, we're trying to tell our story, but th you know, this is a profession that we have. So I was very grateful to, for, to Michael for, for the podcast. You know, this, is a, this is a profession, and, and the profession has principles. The profession has values, and every judge I know uh, with very, very few exceptions, and I've known thousands of judges, really tries to emulate the values of the profession. And some do better than others. But I don't think the public really understands what those values are. And I think, I think to a large extent, that's on us. You know, we don't do a good enough job of talking about, well, what do we do? And how do we do it? And, you know, what, what do we, what do, you know, and, and I think that's, that's a missing link. Can I, can yeah. I just ask you, we're going to go to yeah. questions yeah. in a moment, but th this, is your, this is your chance, because we yeah. held this program to yeah. educate the public. You talk about the need not only for spiritual integrity, setting aside your ego, but for mindfulness, mm. for tuning in during a sentencing hearing, not getting bored and distracted, but actually deep listening to the human stories in front of you. And now judges are confronted with these new pressures that are yeah. so polarizing our elected officials that our society is retreating into armed camps. So psychologically yes. and emotionally, what can judges do well, to maintain the ideals of impartial deliberation so that are necessary I'll, I'll, to, I'll for the future you, of the republic I'll, to survive? I'll, I'll send you my check for asking me that question. No, no, I'm, no, 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 no. I mean, this is, this is really important. Yes, it is. You know, it's like, so when we founded the Berkeley Judicial Institute, uh, what are the three things we care about? One of them is ethics, and this, one of them is independence, and the other one is resiliency. It's, it's, the ability, it's what you're asking about. It's how do you keep judges psychologically healthy so that when, when they're dealing with this, these awesome responsibilities that they have, how do you keep them attentive enough and, and, and managing their stress and managing their emotions and, and being present for people so that, the, that they can do the job right, so that the people who come through the courtroom uh, uh, have a positive experience, have a sense that they were taken seriously and respected and listened to. I mean, this is what we aspire to. You know, we, we want people to have this experience of procedural justice and, and being respected. We also want to be able to take care of ourselves and not, and not burn out. And, and I think this issue of resiliency and, and what judges need to be resilient is enormously important. We're just really starting to get a handle on it. And, and I think, you know, mindfulness is part of it, um, self-care is part of it, um, uh, just learning about active listening is part of it, um, le dealing with implicit bias is part of it. It's, it's, all, it's getting yourself right to do, to do the job and live up to the professional standards. Could I just yeah. add to that? Yeah. I th uh, this is from somebody who's left the bench, so easy for me to say, but 
Uh, I believe that in the name of, of being impartial and not have conflicts of interest and not violating the codes of ethics, to some extent, the judiciary, and I'm gonna, this is a terrible generalization, has withdrawn a bit from the community. And for me, maybe the most important thing that a judge must do is remain in constant contact with the community outside the courtroom. It might be a 4-H club, it might be a Sunday school group, it might be your local hospital, it might be the homeless shelter. I don't care what it is, but I have seen numbers of judges who say, oh, I don't think I better be on that board. Or, and by the way, the Code of Ethics lets us be on educational and philanthropic boards. Uh, or for sure we can work in soup kitchens or whatever else it is. I have heard way too many colleagues across the country say, I just worry that I'm gonna run into somebody or the newspaper's gonna be there and blah, blah, blah. Wrong answer. I think one of the things that keeps us rooted, and one of the things that I think made me a better judge was I was <laughs> burning the candle at all ends, uh, working in schools, doing uh, all kinds of philanthropic work in my community. And as I reflect back on how I approached being a judge, I believe I approached it, I hope I approached it as a solid member of the community that when they saw me in the grocery store, they didn't just immediately think federal judge. They thought, oh yeah, she's on the board of the Arts Center, or she's working with the homeless shelter, or she. We have got to be identified with our communities along with our courts. Just Justice Moreno, yeah, just the last, last word before the questions, but I'll oh, just I, I say, just, I'll, just, I'll just note that you have talked very movingly about the support that the Latino community has given you yeah. at every stage in your career, and I want you to describe what is the right way for you to interact with that community in a way that avoids mm -hmm. being uh, uh, partisan, but nevertheless uh, sensitive to their needs. Well, you know, uh, a long time ago, a, uh, a uh, drama school teacher uh, wrote in a book that I still have, I think as I was going off to college, he said, I think quoting Aristotle said, remember that you are a part of all who you have met. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I come from a Latino community, working class background, et cetera, so that sort of uh, phrase always sticks in my mind that I came from these roots much like uh, Eva did, and uh, that's part of uh, who I am. And that leads me to the uh, question I wanted to answer. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Please do. Uh, I, I heard uh, from the appointments, uh, judicial appointment secretary, Marty Jenkins, uh, he asked the Governor Newsom what are the qualities he wanted uh, in judges. You know, he laid out courage, uh, commitment to public service, intellectual capacity, uh, ethical behavior, humility, and other factors. They're all important. But then he said, uh, but what is, Governor, what is the most important uh, factor you want in the judges that you're going to appoint? And Governor Newsom said, humility. Mm -hmm. I think that's very telling, and it's along the lines of what you said. Humility, the Latin root is probably human. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're all uh, human, we all have to be uh, humble, and you have to recognize uh, where you came from, or where you are, and your obligation to do, uh, to do justice. That is a wonderful quality to sum up, and uh, judges from Judge Hand to Justice Ginsburg uh, have noted that the spirit of liberty is the spirit that is not too sure that it is right, and humility is a quality much, uh, very elusive in our polarized time when both red and blue camps are so certain of their own premises that we've forgotten Justice Holmes' admonition that the Constitution is made for people of fundamentally differing points of view, and it gets to Jeremy's notion that ultimately it's a spiritual task of setting aside your ego, being open to others, and letting the light flow through you. We have time for one or two questions. Can I ask a, Please. a question here? I'm, I'm a trial lawyer, and I, I've been a trial lawyer for 36 years, both in California and Justice Goodsman's uh, jurisdiction where I started. And I've been sitting here increasingly feeling that I, I believe very much in the model of judging that I think the panel has described, and it's pretty consistent. Um, and it's, I think it's a vital thing, and our rule of law depends upon it. 
but it's been my experience increasingly over the last several decades that it doesn't fully fit the judiciary. Um, I would have assumed that judges decided the way you all have described when I started, but in areas including Texas, including the Fifth Circuit, um, where there's been decades of a very politicized selection process, uh, there also are judges who I would not characterize that way, and I think you could show from the results. And I worry greatly when I see all the normal checks and balances of federal selection uh, for the federal judiciary being discarded. So my concern is, you've described a model of the best judges, but what do you see that's happening now? Because I don't think there's a culture so strong in the judiciary that it doesn't matter who gets appointed, you know, it'll then cure um, problems with the appointment. I, I think that's a fair question. I think it's a, tr it's a, troubling, it's a troubling question. Um, because I think the I think the the culture is strong. Uh, it's not so strong that it's going to get everybody. You know, you could always try to find people who don't care about it or who who have an agenda. And it goes back to what my friend Chuck Breyer said. I mean, it's very important not to have an agenda. We have life experience, and I think in a, in every judicial selection process that I've ever seen and in, in they've ever read about, going back to the founding of the republic. The, the life experience of judges makes a difference. I mean, you see it around the edges of their decision making, you know, just how they see facts, what they think is important, how they, how they use their equitable powers. I mean, so you're going to get differences, <clears throat> but it's all within a framework of a, of a legal culture, of a process that we all are committed to. And so the fact that you have even significant differences uh, between, say, the Fifth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit, to me, that, that fact in and of itself is not uh, a bad thing. But I do think the premise of your question concerns me. When you start appointing people, not because they're going to be good judges, but because they're going to be committed to a particular agenda in an unswerving way, uh, yes, that concerns me too. Uh, now, whether uh, that is happening and whether that is happening to a degree that the strength of the judicial culture uh, won't turn it around or that you know, the, just the political process over time will, will correct whatever tendencies are there. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't look into the future. I think it is something we need to be very careful about. And I don't think it's, it's something that, you know, this is not about the current administration or some future administration. It's when, when any president uh, starts to appoint judges solely because the president thinks that the judges are going to vote certain ways all the time, then we really are in trouble. And so I think it's, I think it's a reasonable concern to raise. Uh, I do maintain a certain degree of optimism. And I, I, one of the things I liked about the, the FJC job so much was I got to go everywhere. And, and just since you mentioned the Fifth Circuit, I spent a lot of time in the Fifth Circuit. And, and I think there's a lot of strength there. Uh, it, it's a much more conservative area than California, and it's going to be reflected in a lot of, uh, a lot of decisions. But, but I'm not ready to throw the whole thing out on the theory that it's hyper-partisan. And so I, I just think, it's, I just think it's, it's, a, it's a good caution flag to raise. I'm not quite ready to raise the red flag yet. Can we have I just time. add one yeah. thing yeah. to that? I don't think it's only the executive. Uh, the legislative branch of uh, the Senate, uh, because of their role, has a role to play here in also modeling constitutional values. Uh, and understanding the difference between the legislative process and the judicial branch and its process. And I think for every citizen out there voting, when you are thinking about your candidates and talking to them, one of the issues is whether you're talking to them directly, not about the outcome of a judicial appointment, but rather about what judges should do and must do for the future regardless of who the administration is. We only have checks and balances if all three branches work the way they're supposed to. We have time for one last brief question and let's have it for Justice Moreno. Great, um, I'm Ayla Dice. I'm an immigration judge uh, here in San Francisco. I'm so grateful for this conversation. I'll be your new groupie if you have other other conversations like this. I feel like I hear um, death penalty cases every day and that the stakes are so high. The flip side is that I also have 
an undescribably rewarding job in, in that I get to uh, uh, give people asylum in this country and, and fulfill dreams for, for them and their um, ge generations below them. My question to you is, as former judges, um, during the shutdown, the government shutdown this year, I was not permitted to work. And I found myself completely paralyzed by depression. <laughs> um, I realized how, um, how intertwined my sense of identity was, how invested I am in my job as a judge. And so my question to you was um, transitioning off of being a judge, which you've clearly put so much into over the years, was that difficult at all or was it quite easy? <laughs> The question was, was it the transition from being a, a judge to the private sector, whatever I did? Yes. You know, I, uh, you know, not to be flippant, I, I think it was fairly easy uh, for me. I was ready to, uh, to move on. I felt I had additional chapters in my life uh, to write. I mean, I've, I've, uh, before becoming a judge, I worked for a law firm. So after I left the Supreme Court, I went with a law firm. I liked that environment. And then the opportunity came up where I was approached by the Obama administration for an ambassadorship position. That's a good good work if you can get it. Uh, and uh, once the new administration came in, I, I checked my options, and now I'm a mediator, arbitrator, neutral evaluator, if you will. And I just I just move on, and uh, I've had a lot of different uh, positions, but. I think someone, not if it was you, uh, Dinal, or someone else said earlier, but my persona still is always as a judge. And I'm very glad that what I'm doing now is very judicial uh, in nature. And I think I bring that to the, to the matters that I preside over uh, to this day. So to answer your question, the transitions for me have not been difficult. I well, this panel. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you, uh, you, uh, I was going to not be Chief Justice uh, Roberts and cut we off. So very quick last word. And then, okay. Yeah. Just uh, I'll I'll tell you the the downside is you're not a federal judge anymore, and it's pretty nice to be in the federal <laughs> judge. The good side is you can speak your mind and you can say what you want to say, and you can. You know, I, I just fully admit, you can do what I've done today, is be a bit of the school marm, and uh, say, you know, we got a job to do out there, and it's not just the judges who are going to do it. It's going to be the lawyers and the everybody throughout uh, the public, the voters. Wonderful. Well, Jeremy, I am so grateful for this collaboration between the Berkeley Judicial Center and the National Constitution Center. Let us keep this uh, conversation going, take the show on the road, and continue to illuminate the human side of judging. Please join me in thanking our panelists.